Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I am Matt Phillips from Linford Winery Wheeling, and today we are talking about reserve wines. Uh, we have our reserve case sale coming up next weekend. So March 26th through 28th, members can receive 50% off a mixed case of reserve wines. So tonight we're gonna to talk about some of those reserve wines so you can get to know them a little bit better and hopefully help make some decisions for placing your case order. Um, you can place your order with any of your location, wherever you have your membership at. Uh, so Wheeling, Roselle, Wheaton, or Naperville. I'd recommend calling ahead, especially for the Wheeling location, um, so that way we can pull your order in advance. So with that, it is Thirsty Thursday, and uh, my glass is empty, as we can see. So it's time for me to get a little libation going. And since it is reserve night, I figured it would be a good opportunity to bust out the decanter. We'll talk a little bit more about decanting later, but in the meantime, let's get my wine poured. Go set the decanter down, get a little aroma action. Ooh, it's reserve night, so everything's going to be big and rich. Cheers! Mm. Okay, so reserve wines. What does it mean when I say something is a reserve wine? So the federal government. They have so many rules for all the different things that can go on our labels. Reserve, however, is a term that is left up to the winery to decide how they want to define. So in our case, we use reserve to mean any one of three different options. Either the grapes were of exceptional quality. So when the grapes arrived to us, we thought these are so good, we have to find some way to designate that this was an exceptional harvest year. Or we source these grapes from somewhere we wouldn't normally get our grapes from. And so once we sort of figure out that, if these grapes are going to reach that designation, they'll be called a reserve. Another way that it can happen is if something happened in the production facility that was unique to what we normally do. So things like double oak aging, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The batonage method, um, which is something that as the wine's maturing in the barrel, you're sort of mixing the wine up in there to create more of a creamy texture to it. Um, another option, um, perhaps just how long it was hanging out in that barrel, or if it was going for extended periods in um, really specialized oak. So oak that is designed to extract more oak flavor into the wine or create a more refined flavor profile. All things like that can go into the reserve designation from the unique techniques perspective. The other option is sometimes wines just perform exceptionally well as they go through that fermentation process. So when you encounter a wine that the winemakers received, they thought it's already going to be great because it's Linford wine, so we always make great wine to begin with. But as this wine has gone through the fermentation process and aging, it's gone above and beyond our expectations. So we have to let people know that this one is really something special. And so that's where reserve designation comes in. Um, also, these wines are going to be more complex than our classic wines. They're going to have longer, longer aging potential, so something if you want to lay down for a while, you've got an option there if you're building your cellar out a little bit. Um, but overall, these wines are great to drink today, better to drink tomorrow in some cases, and always a good time and plenty of excuses to open reserve wines when you see fit. So let's get started with meeting our reserve wines. So the first one I have is our lone white wine on the reserve list, and that is Chardonnay 2018 Reserve. So the Chardonnay 2018 Reserve, this is what we like to call a red drinker's white. So it's a oaky, bolder, really more kind of enveloping Chardonnay experience um, that we recommend serving at room temperature. So it sort of mimics that red wine style for how we use it. Um, so this one is grown in the Columbia Valley in Washington, which you're going to notice a trend here for the first few wines. So Columbia Valley in Washington, you'll see a lot of the classic French varietals coming out of there, also some sort of uniquely American styling there as well. But these grapes do exceptionally well in the Columbia Valley because they've got amazing soil and the benefit of sort of desert-like conditions. So the roots have to really go deep and deep into the earth to pull out as much water as they can possibly find and creates really nice concentrated flavor to the grapes. We added 15% Viognier to this Chardonnay and that is gonna add our floral component. So when we think about Chardonnay, sometimes they can kind of be like an oak bomb or butter bomb. This floral component that we're getting from the Viognier is gonna brighten everything on the palate. And this one makes it really nice for sort of a transitional use. So you think about in the fall when things are just starting to get cold, or now when we have like snow a couple days ago and then it's starting to warm up a bit, this is a really good seasonal transition wine as it goes from colder to warmer or warmer to colder. So um, with the Chardonnay, 
This one's exceptional because not only do we have phenomenal Chardonnay grapes to begin with that blend with the Viognier, we also used French oak for this one. And French oak is something we don't use all that often at Linfrid. Um, and when it comes to oak aging, you've got basically two options. You can go French oak or American oak. There's a few other types in there, but for Linford purposes, we're looking at French and American. And so French oak tends to be more of a subtle flavor. It's got a little bit more um, kind of vanilla, almond, um, sort of a softer oak note to it. Whereas your American oak is a little bit more robust. That's the one that's going to hit you across the face with some pepper, with some leather, with some spice. They're a little bit more aggressive. Linford, liking that bigger, bolder oak flavor, tends to lean more towards the American. But in some cases, French oak really works so much better because it lets the grape sort of just showcase itself and sort of um, let the oak sort of shine through, sort of peeking through almost. Um, so in this case, we're going to have um, this nice creaminess because we did do some of that surly batonnage happening, um, but also that French oak. Um, it was fermented in the French oak barrel, which is going to intensify the creaminess of the wine. So look for vanilla, some lemon zest notes here, some coconut, some almond, but really the texture is the thing that sets this one apart, and it's that creaminess that coats your palate. And so when you think about pairing that, think about something that would benefit from something kind of buttery. So um, crab cake or lobster or um, like roasted chicken, where you get those really nice flavors, and I'm just picturing just kind of the juice is dripping off the chicken right now and mouth is watering. Um, but with that Chardonnay, it just marries so beautifully. So next up, let's talk about what I poured myself when I got started here this evening. And so this is our first red of the night, which is also coming from the Columbia Valley in Washington. And this is Cabernet Sauvignon 2015 Reserve. And so, not 100% Cab, this one has 5% Merlot in it, but oak aged for 38 months in American oak. So bigger, bolder oak flavor coming across here, also extended period of time. So only about six or eight months on that Chardonnay. We're looking at 38 months, over three years with this Cabernet here. And really, oh, it's classic Cab, um, that cassis, black currant, plummy kind of nose to it. There's some black pepper going on in there. chocolate, espresso, kind of hits your palate, and then there's this sort of lingering herb. Um, I'm going to call it sage for today, but um, just really nice, and the tannins are starting to soften in this one. So this one's got a few years of bottle age on it, and that's really starting to shine through. And that's where we talk about excellent aging potential, so something that's going to be able to lay down for a while. So I've got my wines on my rack over here. So these are wines that, by and large, are going to get consumed a little bit quicker than um, I might, you know, suggest for somebody um, who's looking for long aging potential. But a wine like this Cab, it's delicious now, but with 10 years or more of aging is going to get only better because those tannins are going to start to slip away and it's going to create more of a velvety texture on your palate. Um, so with that, um, if you've got a wine that's maybe too aggressive right now, letting it sort of sit back on the shelf for a while longer might be to your benefit just to soften some of those tannins so it doesn't totally grab the side of your mouth when you go to drink it. Um, if you are in aging wines, I recommend buying multiple. So if you know something, you really liked it in the tasting room, and we tell you this one's got a 10-year aging potential to it, buy at least a few bottles and then try to track it over um, a few different intervals. And so I think the best way to do that, um, and also to let the people in your house know that this is a wine that you're saving, not meant to be just kind of opened whenever, is to mark the bottle. And I think a nice way to do it, especially if you're going to be tracking the flavor profiles, is to either keep a wine journal, or what I find even a little bit easier is to write yourself a note, slip it in an envelope, and tape it to your next bottle with the date or the year when you're planning on drinking that next one. So this way, when you go to open up that bottle, you get that opportunity to see, okay, what was I thinking? What was I feeling about this wine two, three years ago? Um, you know, and you can jot a few extra notes in there for yourself as well. Um, you know, so in the case of this one, like, I would probably say, you know, Dear Matt in 2023, um, I hope you enjoyed this Cabernet 2015 as much as I did back in 2021. Um, if it's still a raging pandemic, then probably you've already consumed this bottle, but if not, these are the aroma palette descriptions that I have for this wine. Here's what I ate with it that night. Enjoy. Love you. Looking great. All that kind of stuff. And then it's attached to the bottle, and anybody else who comes across my wine rack in the household knows immediately, do not touch that bottle until 2023, or unless you have my consent. 
Um, otherwise, um, you can end up in a situation like one of our members who told me a story some years ago where they had one of our Cabernets from the 90s. Um, this was a Napa-grown Cabernet. I believe it was a 94 vintage, so we retailed it at $100 a bottle. It's nothing we can sell anymore. We don't have any more of it to sell. Um, and their college-age kids made sangria with it. Probably wasn't the most delicious sangria just because that cab was awesome on its own and adding a cup of sugar and fresh fruit to it probably wouldn't have made that um, the greatest. But um, all the same, had they had a note on it, we would have known, go for the Fred's Red or go for the sangria that Linford makes, and you can avoid all of that. So from there, we've got Cabernet in the books. I'm going to smell it one more time. And then we'll go along to our final Columbia Valley Reserve wine right now, and that is our Merlot 2013 Reserve. So, Merlot. Merlot. Okay, I know some people say, Merlot, nope, tune it out, not into it. This one is outstanding and has a unique technique associated with it. So 100% Merlot. This one's all full-blown Merlot from Washington. And Washington is really where we get the premier American Merlot grapes. They grow exceptionally well there. They've got complex flavor profiles, excellent pairing potential, um, and this one in particular, awesome aging potential as well. It's a 2013 that's still drinking exceptionally well and still has room to grow, which we'll get to in just a second. So black cherry, caramel, um, maybe a little bit of tobacco note to it to get a little bit of that earthiness going on, and then has this spice and this lingering finish to it. Um, this is a really good one for Easter. Um, it kind of has that, um, it, it can handle game or like the lamb flavors. I think really, really good here. Um, so we used 36 months of American oak aging, but we use something called double oak technique. And so what double oak is, we take the first 24 months, so we've got that lifespan of three years that the wine spent in the barrel. So first 24 months, we had in brand new American oak. Then... We transferred all of that for the last 12 months into even newer American oak. So that led us to um, oak that's two years younger, bigger, bolder flavor. And so that last 12 months is getting infused with all this extra oak flavor. Now, when I first read that, I anticipated when we released this wine that it was going to be an oak bomb. And that was going to be the predominant flavor I got. What ended up happening with that double oak, that last 12 months, actually concentrated all of the other flavors. So everything is really explosive on the palate, and because that oak acts almost like a preservative for the flavors, it's gonna hold on to that aging potential for that much longer. So Merlot is a grape that ages well to begin with, but now with that double oak technique, it's gonna go even a little bit further. So already drinking exceptionally well. Um, if you are looking for that Easter wine, I think this is the one to go for if you wanna have a red on the table. Um, and speaking of Easter and pairing, um, really more, more so, reserve wines, because they're bigger, bolder, they lend themselves to decadent, really big, heavy meals um, because the wine has enough heft to stand up to the intensity of all of those flavor profiles. Now, I can't eat like that every day, and subsequently, reserve wines I don't drink every day. But I also like to sometimes just celebrate how the wine performs on its own or with just a couple key items. And so um, in the case of like the Merlot, having a really good piece of chocolate with it, or if I were to do something like Camembert with blueberry compote and just have that with my Merlot, I'm really just focusing on the Merlot flavor profiles and getting that benefit of a food pairing that's really pretty um, easy on the palate and it's gonna work really well with the wine. And I'm not overloading my palate with all these other flavor profiles. I'm just focusing on what's the Merlot taste like, and these are some enhancements to go along with it for my food. Again, pair it with a big meal as well, because it's going to be able to hold up to the big meal, but if you really want to celebrate that Merlot, try it with just a couple key things that you think would pair exceptionally well. Um, also, I like to play around with, you know, with my champagne. I love to take something high-end and pair it with something humble. So champagne and potato chips works really well together, same deal with the reserve wines. You can find humble foods to go along with it. In fact, this Cabernet tonight, I'm having a burger with Merck's cheddar later, and I know the cab is going to work exceptionally well. I've elevated that burger now by elevating my wine experience with it. Again, maybe another day, day down the road, I would say, no, save this for when I have the blue cheese crusted filet. But tonight, the burger's going to get the job done, and so will the Cabernet. Um, finally, if you or I guess to that note, if you're looking to impress people when you're you've got a dinner party and you want to whip out some of your reserve wines, um, 
decanting is a really cool way to do that, which again, I'm going to keep teasing that. We're going to talk more about decanting in a minute. Um, but also making sure you start with your reserve wines. So serve the reserve wines early in the evening when our palates are not fatigued. So the more we drink, the more food we consume, our palates start saying, okay, I've only got so many more taste bud receptors that I can really give a, a full explanation of what you're tasting today. And so if we go too big, too big too soon, by the end of the night, I'm not going to be able to pick up on all the nuanced flavors. And part of drinking a reserve is picking up on all of those nuanced flavors. And so um, start with your reserve wines, and then you can slowly pull back to your classics, finish the night with your Fred's Red, just kind of ease out of that reserve category. Because as the palate fatigues, you're actually going to want something that has um, maybe more fruit flavor to it, maybe not so much tannin. Um, so think in terms of timeline, um, and also who you're drinking with. Um, if you've got somebody who is not going to appreciate your reserve wine, um, they're going to, you know, pop an ice cube into it, or, you know, they're going to think that they, you know, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and just, you know, unload a sugar packet. Um, it's happened. Um, maybe, you know, just know to pass them when you're bringing the decanter around the table. So now we move into our second section, which is the Petite Syrah family. So I have three Petite Syrahs that are currently available for our reserve sale. And the first one is our 2012. And so this is also going to take us not only to Petite Syrahs, but back to California. So these are coming from Clarksburg, California. And so Clarksburg is near Sacramento. And um, what's cool with this Petite Syrah, it's 100% Petite Syrah, but it's 90% 2012 vintage, 10% 2013 vintage, which is one of the other ones we're gonna chat about in just a moment. Um, and so what the 2013 does is add this exuberance, this energy to that 2012. The 2012 is delicious on its own, um, but it leans a little bit in the earthier category. And so by adding that little bit of extra 2013, we just boost that flavor a little bit more. We're able to elevate things just a bit. We add a bit more tannin, a, a kind of a younger punch to the wine there. Um, again, 36 months of American oak aging here. Um, it, while it's leaning more in that cedar, leather, star anise category, we also get a blueberry note or a blackberry note shining through, which is sort of indicative of the petite Syrah world. Um, aged cheeses or goat cheese, I anything mean, that has that little bit of tang to it, really nice with this one here. Um, and also ready to drink now. You've got a 2012 vintage. We're almost 12, uh, 10 years in with it. So something that if you want to drink a little bit sooner, really nice um, candidate for that. Um, and then with that um, age also comes another reason for us to decant. So as I've got my decanter back here, um, when you're picking out a decanter, go for something that's going to match your style, but also something that you feel that you can easily handle um, because you want to make sure you can actually pour from it. I've seen some really beautiful decanters, but they're so heavy you need three people to actually pour the wine. And so I've got something here that's got a nice deep punt, so that nice basin in the bottom. I don't know if you can see it from there, um, but so my thumb can easily rest in there, and then I can get nice extension with the wine. I can pour into my glass easily. Um, I can also hold it from the top. It's very, very light. Um, this one's also a little bit easier to clean. I just have to get the wand in there just to move things around. Some of the other decanters, you need to get special cleaning materials for it. But what's cool with decanting is, in addition to helping open up the aromas and flavors, so you've got a wine that's been sitting in a bottle for 10 years, you want to make sure that it's got an opportunity to breathe. It's got an opportunity to sort of relax a bit before it comes around. Um, and so um, the other benefit there is it might catch some of the sediment for you. So sediment, something naturally occurring from the fermentation process, um, it's a sign of a wine that was um, minimally handled, which is good, so minimal processing, always great. Um, but sediment sometimes doesn't feel so great when it hits your palate, it kind of adds a gritty sensation. So we want to avoid that. So we can try to catch it in the bottle as much as possible, and then we also have the advantage of catching it in the bottom of our decanter here. Um, some people even hold a candle up um, underneath their decanter as they're pouring and kind of see through and start catching some of the sediment as it goes through. So definitely considerations there. Also, by decanting, you are adding an extra layer of um, sort of panache to your service. So when the decanter comes to the table as opposed to just the bottle, the decanter adds a little bit of mystique. People usually think that it means you're serving them something that has a little bit um, more intrigue to it. Um, it also just shows that you're really showcasing the wine in its best possible way. Um, so I would say decant more often um, and try decanting something you wouldn't normally think to decant. So use that Fred's Red, decant it, and see what happens with those flavor profiles. Um, I will just mention, if you hear kind of a, um, a scratching sensation, um, that is a um, 
a cat who is feeling very uh, precocious this evening and, uh, and playing at the moment. So I apologize if there's any additional feedback there. Um, so decant, add to your experience. A cat, perhaps, not so much adding to your experience. So I think I scared him a little bit. Um, all right, so from there we go to 2013 Petite Syrah. So 2013 Petite Syrah, so this is the one that was 10% in that 2012. 2013, this is 100% 2013 Petite Syrah. And this one, also coming from Clarksburg, um, 36 months of American oak, beautiful blackberry notes, some vanilla, some espresso bean, black currant, really intense tannin. This is that gripping, bold, it pours out of the, the bottle almost looking black. I mean, it's just so intense. Right off the bat, um, you know you're getting a really nice, deep, rich Petite Syrah experience with this. Um, so chocolate or a spice-crusted meat, really, really awesome here. It has the oomph to stand up to all that intensity. Um, this one also went through the double oak technique like that Merlot 2013. So similar profile there, but this one really retained the oak well and really retained its tannin. So even though it's 2013 vintage, we've got seven, eight years in the bottle, it's still really holding on. And so that means it's going to age for that much longer. We're looking at another 10, 15 years maybe with this one. So it's super exciting for one you want to lay down for a bit. So if you kind of compare the two, if you're looking for your 2012 versus your 2013, 2012 sort of hits your palate like sort of smooth jazz. You're sitting in like a leather chair and just kind of letting the world sort of just kind of relax away. And then Petit Syrah 2013 is like big band swing and you're doing the jitterbug and we just won the war and it's exuberant. Um, again, another good word for the night, exuberant. Um, there is so much energy coming off that 2013. Now the final Petit Syrah that I have tonight is one that will not necessarily say Petit Syrah on the label, um, but is super exciting for us and one that we do not get to play around with all that often because um, it does not always make its way to our shelves. And that is our 40th anniversary lineage. So lineage is a um, tradition that started um, back in our 35th anniversary. We had a lineage release that year. Um, and now we've got our 40th anniversary lineage, which came out a couple years ago. And so this is 100% Petite Syrah. It's a 2015 vintage, and it spent 36 months in American oak. This oak, however, was from Seguin Moreau, which is a very famous cooperage out of California. And this oak was made especially for Linfred and designed to have that maximum flavor extraction. So you're going to get the best possible and the most oak flavor possible out of that barrel. We call it 200% oak aging just because the wine is getting that much more surface area touching that oak. So that much more oak flavor going into the wine, which again is going to preserve this wine for an exceptional amount of time. The other thing that's going to preserve this wine for an exceptional amount of time is the alcohol by volume, which clocks in at 16.5%. So you figure our port wines are about 18%, um, or our port inspired wines are 18%. So a percent and a half below that, and you've got a really nice, deep, dark, rich red wine. Um, and so it almost has a port-like texture because it's so intense and opulent. So opulence is a word that we sometimes throw around in the wine industry, but this is a wine that really embodies that rich, elegant flavor. And it's it passes over your palate like velvet, um, and it's so rich. Um, definitely want to decant this one. Definitely want to consider laying this one down for several years, but if you want to pick up multiple bottles of it with the 50% off case sale, it goes from $85 down to $42.50. So something definitely to consider. It's an investment, but an investment in your future. You can write yourself the note for what you think of it now and then try it five years from now, but outstanding flavor profiles here. Buy your really good steak that night. Make that night the event. Um, we have a lot of times where people are saving wines for anniversary or um, you know job promotion or some other moment to celebrate, which is awesome. And wines should always be used for your celebration, but sometimes we just need to celebrate the wine itself. And so with a wine like Lineage, or really any of these reserve wines, being able to take the time to say, you know what, I earned this, I'm going to drink this and enjoy it and really just sort of be mindful and deep dive this particular wine is such a cool experience and um, kind of really makes the night. Um, so that's Cellar Master Ernie meowing in the background. Um, and he is ready, I think, uh, for me to um, stop talking, start drinking. And so with that, I'll remind you one more time that the reserve case sale is coming up on March 26th through the 28th. 50% off reserve wines, members only. If you're not a member of the wine club, you can always join at your local tasting room. 
And with that, I wish you a very happy Thirsty Thursday. Cheers. And I will see you all soon.